They hang the man and flog the woman that steal the goose from off the common, but let the greater villain loose that steals the common from the goose. Eighteenth century English folk poem quoted in Bill Wade, A New Tragedy for the Commons, George Wright Forum. I grew up among the vast tracts of post-war suburbia around Chicago. My parents, like their parents, were urban people who grew up in three flats and apartment blocks in Chicago and Brooklyn. So as a suburban kid with city-bred parents, I did not have much exposure to wild nature or any sort of family tradition in the great outdoors. There were no camping trips, no summer camps in the North Woods, no grand tours of the national parks. How then did I come to spend most of my life seeking out, enjoying, longing for, teaching about, reading about, studying, contemplating, and advocating for wild land? A good chunk of the credit must go to the visionary planners and civic leaders who had the bold foresight and civic devotion to establish the Forest Preserve District of Cook County, Illinois in 1916, the same year when the National Park Service was created. Growing eventually to 67,000 acres, or roughly 11% of the nation's second most populous county, the Cook County Forest Preserves consist of corridors of wild land along the region's riverways and beyond. Along with the neighboring county's forest preserve districts, they form a green necklace of forests, wetlands, prairies, and savannas around one of America's most intensely urban metro areas, whose asphalt sprawl stretches across the flatlands of northern Illinois for nearly 7,200 square miles. Today, an appraisal of the real estate on which these preserves sit would likely yield an astronomical sum that would suggest to a free market advocate that frogs, big blue stem, and burr oaks are not the best and highest use of this land. It is something of a small miracle, then, that this wild land, some of which has never seen a plow or saw, remains intact. As a ten-year-old kid marooned in an ocean of manicured lawns, cul-de-sacs, strip malls, and parking lots, I would seek my escape by jumping on my bike and riding the two miles to Lynn Woods, the nearest outpost of the forest preserves along the north branch of the Chicago River. Despite being little more than 100 acres and surrounded by six-lane arterials and fast food joints, Lynn Woods was, to me at least, a mighty citadel, bursting with mystery, adventure, inspiration, and integrity. In this little refuge, mammoth cottonwoods, which seemed to me as big as sequoias, lined the bottomlands beside the river and were often full of raucous roosting crows. In the drier areas, dark old forests of red oaks and sugar maples were carpeted with trillium and mayapples in the spring. Along the western edge, the forest gave way to sunny open prairies and brushy rabbit-laden meadows that filled the humid summer air with the smell of wild bergamot and Virginia mountain mint, both of which grew profusely. There, the natural world cast its spell on me, and led me to become its lifelong student. There, I wandered aimlessly for hours, and once tried, unsuccessfully of course, to fish with a stick and a string and a safety pin. There, I taught myself to identify trees, and once fell through the ice of the river on a ten-degree day, and lived to tell about it. Later, as a teen, when I procured the driver's license that conferred full citizenship on a child of the suburbs, I began to branch out farther, exploring the larger preserves along the Des Plaines River and beyond. By the time I got to college, there was no stopping me. Over the years, I have had the joy and the privilege of trekking and tramping through public lands, from the dark, dripping rainforests of Washington's Olympic Peninsula to enchanting sea islands off Georgia's coast, and from the magnificently austere canyonlands of the southwest to the still, clear lakes and emerald green forests of the north woods.